I invite the member for Richmond South Centre to lead the House in prayer or reflection. Heaven, oh, sorry. Heavenly Father, as the events over the day unfold, we seek your guidance and your peace. We know that you are with us, and we ask that you guide us in our deliberations today. May we be temperate and respectfully of one, uh, one another as we exchange ideas on how to make this blessed and rich land that we call home a better place for our fellow citizens. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Introduction by members. Member for Shoe Swap. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Speaker. On Monday, Sam and Armin, indeed, our province lost a well respected member of our community, Petronella Peach, uh, passed away unexpectedly in Salmon Arm with her loving husband, Gordon, at her side. Nell grew up in the ne Netherlands during World War II and often commented on her admiration for Canada's assistance during the war. Nell is best known as a volunteer extraordinaire a breast cancer survivor, dragon boater, and an advocate for the SPCA. However, Nell is best known for her tireless advocacy for the Canadian Diabetes Association. Diagnosed with diabetes near 40 years ago, she used her experience to become a passionate advocate for people living with diabetes. Nell served as a regional chair for the association's interior BC region and was an impressive fundraiser for Team Diabetes, participating in both national and international marathon events. In 2010, she carried the Olympic torch in Salmon Arm and was recognized with numerous accolades, including the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, the Canadian Diabetes Association's Regional Service Award, and National Volunteer Award. A hardworking, determined, inspiring member of Salmon Arm. I wish to express my sincere condolences to her partner and husband, Gordon, family and friends. Nell, you are a tireless warrior and a dear friend. You will be missed. Madam Clerk. Introduction of bills. Statements by members. Member for Delta South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise in the House in recognition of World Bee Day. The fact is we all depend on the survival of bees, but many of us just don't know it. Today the United Nations remind us that pollination is a fundamental process for the survival of our ecosystems. Pollinators contribute directly to food security and conserving biodiversity. Interestingly, bees pollinate close to one-third of the foods we consume each day. Bee pollination makes it easier to obtain more fruits, berries, and seeds, as well as improve the quality of most of our food products. Without bee pollination, we would have less apples, strawberries, blueberries, and cranberries to go around in this province. Sadly, the COVID-19 pandemic has placed immense pressure on our beekeeping sector. Like countless others across the province, beekeepers have had to adapt their operations to meet public health measures and ensure their sector continues to thrive. That's why this year's World Bee Day is focused on bee production and best practices. Around the world, beekeepers are encouraging us to be engaged and bring awareness to the importance of traditional beekeeping. The prevalence of bee-derived products as well as the industry's sustainable development goals. So what can we all do on an individual basis to support our bee populations? Well, here are just a few suggestions. Let's get out in our gardens this summer and plant a wide variety of native plants. Let's continue to shop locally, support farmers, and buy BC-sourced honey. Let's consider, make, consider making bee water fountains in our backyards by leaving a bowl of water outside for their consumption. And let's encourage our farmers to continue diversifying their crops and avoid using harmful pesticides. We don't want our bees to only survive, we want them to thrive. The truth is, the decline of bees affects us all. It is incumbent on each of us to show our appreciation for bees and their role in sustaining our beautiful environment. I hope all members of this house can join me in wishing every beekeeper in British Columbia a very happy World Bee Day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Courtney Comox. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. May is Child Care Month in British Columbia, and today marks Child Care Provider Appreciation Day. It's a day to recognize the amazing work being done by people who've chosen a very special career. 
Early care and learning professionals are the workforce behind the workforce. They make it possible for parents to go back to work or school and contribute to their families and their community's success. As mom Tasha shared, you know you've got it right the day your kids ask whether it's a mommy day or Tigger too, and they're disappointed it's not daycare. It's great for a parent to know that their kids are getting the best out of every day, thanks to the safe and nurturing world of discovery that childcare staff are dedicated to providing their little charges. Stimulating creativity, developing skills, learning to get along with others, nurturing language and culture. Child care providers help children build a strong foundation for success. Providers at places like Beaufort Centre at North Island College in Courtney and the Huayats Umeixu Child Care Centre on the West Coast, they there are providers in every community, supporting families and creating environments that inspire kids to dream big and instill a lifelong love of learning. This year, safety took on a whole new dimension. They've gone over and above to keep our children and families safe. They've been on the front lines despite the added challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. They're our child care superheroes, and their tireless dedication deserves our praise and our thanks. So please take some time today to thank a child care provider for their commitment to caring for children in your community. You can find them making an incredible difference for kids and parents, workplaces and community in every part of British Columbia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for West Vancouver, Capilano. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This Sunday will mark 107 years since the Kamagata Maru steamship from India arrived in Vancouver with 376 passengers, most of which were Sikh, Muslims, and Hindus of South Asian origin who came, like many of our relatives did, to seek better lives here in Canada and in British Columbia. Sadly, the government of the day denied entry to most of the passengers simply due to their ethnicity and they were forced to return to India. Upon their return to India, many were arrested and put in jail by the British. This is a stain on the history of British Columbia and highlights the racist and discriminatory era of the uh, immigration policies of the time. Now, we've come a long way since then, but there is a lot more that remains to be done where people of all cultures are accepted and respected. Racism and intolerance are still in so many aspects of our society. Just recently, Vancouver was named the anti-Asian hate crime capital of North America. This is a title that puts us to shame. It's time we all stand up to condemn racism. Let's not forget, the South Asian community has also helped to build British Columbia forge strong cultural ties between India and our province, as well as furthering trade to diversify our economy. As the most ethnically diverse province in Canada, British Columbia is a place where everyone deserves to feel safe, regardless of their ethnic, racial, or religious background. The anniversary of the Komagata Maru incident is an opportunity to reflect upon the past, appreciate British Columbia's history, and renew our commitment to work for a future where our kids are proud to call British Columbia home. We know we have to do better. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Nanaimo, North Cowchen. Member for Nanaimo, North Cowchen. Okay, let's move. Let's move on to Saanich North End Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 2009, the longhouse in Fuseo was lost to a devastating fire. The smoke from the blaze could be seen across the region, and the impact has been felt for the 12 years that our relatives have been without this critical home that is the center of our Saanich culture. It is on the floor of this house where we practice sacred ceremony that have been passed from one generation to the next. It's where we come of age celebrate and memorialize life. It's where we gather as families and as community. It's through ceremony that we learn of who we are as Huonguk people, how we are connected to each other, how we are connected to our territory. And it's ceremony that breathes life into the laws and governance. 
When my relatives at Xeo broke ground on their new longhouse last fall, they shared the deep loss that they have been feeling. But they did not only shed tears of sorrow of what might have been, they also were tears of joy for what will come when their new home is built. It was evident for all who attended the deep sense of hope, our CM, our elders and honored ones, that once again our beautiful culture will come alive within the walls of this new longhouse. In 2019, I had the honor of witnessing this in Weglisla when the Heitsuk Nation Big House was opened. It was a powerful experience. As Kuseyot Elder and Councillor Mavis Underwood shared with me about the Longhouse project, there is already incredible benefits for the community. Jobs and skills training for the young men who, on the site who are also experiencing the energy of having a hand in building this new home that will again invigorate the crucial link with culture, teachings and our elders. My Kuseyot relatives are inviting the public to contribute to their new Longhouse. And while they are nearly all there, they are raising funds to complete the project, and you can learn more at sayout.ca slash bighouse, T-S-A-W-O-U-T dot C-A slash bighouse. I hope you'll join them in supporting this exciting project. Member for Langley East. Honourable Speaker, thank you for recognizing me to rise and speak in the House today about a subject which we should all care deeply about. Today is World Bee Day. Each year on May 20th, we celebrate the most important contributions that bees make to all things in our world. Bees play a major role in agriculture as pollinators of crops, contributing to an estimated $550 million to the economy in British Columbia, and over $2 billion across Canada. Honourable Speaker, nearly a quarter of the bee colony farms in Metro Vancouver and the Fraser Valley are located in Langley. One such example, um, in my riding is McInnes Farm, a family-owned farm business that uses permaculture practices using a nat natural topography, ponds, streams, and forests, producing a brand called Bee Ingredients, Honey, from one of the 50-plus colonies of honeybees on their farms. In partnership with The Honest Company, this pollinator conservation area also helps educate the public about the importance of all pollinators. Honourable Speaker, bees, pol uh, other pollinators such as butterflies, bats and hummingbirds are increasingly under threat. Approximately 90% of the world's uh, wild flowering plant species depend entirely, or at least in part, on animal pollination, as well as over 75% of the world's food crops. It takes one colony of honeybees, around 30,000 bees, to pollinate an acre of fruit trees. Our government recognizes the important role that bees play in our province. The BBC program enhances bee health through the province of British Columbia. 62 BBC product, uh, projects have been funded to date. I ask that the House join me today in celebrating the important role pollinators play in contributing directly to food security and conserving biodiversity. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Madam Clerk. Oral questions by members. Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, BC's restart program has been on hold since November of last year. Multiple jurisdictions have released specific, detailed reopening plans. And that allows businesses to do the critical planning that is necessary. Saskatchewan, in fact, has a detailed roadmap, and that is based on vaccination rates. Washington State is on track to fully reopen its economy by June the 30th. Quebec is planning to have outdoor festivals by that time as well. Well, here in BC, local restaurants, retailers, and tourism operators are all asking to know what they can expect and when they will hear. So will the Premier stand up and tell us today when he will be releasing a reopening strategy for our province that includes detailed targets and timelines so that British Columbia's businesses can have some of the certainty that they deserve? Minister of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and thank you to the Leader of the Official Opposition for the question. Um, it's certainly everyone knows that the pandemic has had lots of uncertainty, uncertainty for people, uncertainty for businesses, uh, and, uh, and we're all feeling hopeful. 
We're starting to see people get booked for vaccinations. We're starting to see people actually get vaccinated, uh, and that's giving us all hope. Um, the Premier has already indicated that uh, the Provincial Health Office and the Premier will be uh, announcing um, what that restart plan may look like on uh, Tuesday next week, and there'll be more information uh, for everyone at that time. Leader of the Official Opposition, Supplemental. Well, thank you, and we certainly know the Premier has a track record of showing up and messing up. He's still giving contradictory statements. In fact, he says he doesn't want to give people false hope, and then he turns around and does exactly that. And, and in fact, yesterday, when asked, the Minister of Education was asked about a $50 million reduction in COVID-specific funding for school districts, and she went on to explain that, well, we can make that reduction because it won't be needed in September. Universities have been told that they will reopen. Well, apparently the Premier and the government are busy making plans for the fall, but unfortunately businesses are not in the same position. They have been left with uncertainty. They have no idea if this government has a specific plan to restart the economy of British Columbia. So again, to the Premier, will he commit to, making, uh, to announcing a specific plan that includes targets and timelines? Our businesses in British Columbia are struggling. They need certainty, and what they need from this government is to finally give them a plan. Minister of Jobs and Economic Recovery. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. And um, uh, from the beginning of the pandemic, we've been working closely with the business community, uh, with not-for-profits, with uh, various stakeholders. It's been a challenging time. There's no doubt about it. Um, I don't think anyone can deny that. Uh, but we've been doing it together. It's been really a Team BC approach here in British Columbia that's served us well. We've uh, we created uh, an industry. Uh, we created a, an industry engagement table with order, over 75 associations uh, representing uh, various sectors of our economy. Uh, we meet almost every uh, two, maybe sometimes three weeks, uh, to discuss uh, the latest uh, pandemic measures. Uh, Dr. Henry uh, takes questions so that everybody's in the same room hearing the same questions, hearing the same answers, and that's how we've been trying to provide some certainty during a very uh, uncertain time. That being said, uh, I've already shared with a member that we'll be uh, releasing uh, a plan on uh, Tuesday, um, and, uh, and there'll be more information. I believe a uh, briefing has been booked with both uh, the official opposition and the third party uh, to give them details on that as well. Member for Abbotsford West. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, a little breaking news, that uh, cruise ship bill that stood no chance of passing the U.S. Congress, a few moments ago it just passed the House of Representatives, it's on its way to the President for signature. I'll await the Premier's next sterling prediction with great anticipation. <laughs> the list of agencies demanding a restart plan from the uh, uh, the Premier grows daily. The beleaguered Tourism uh, Industries Association says this, give us the goalposts. Give us something to work towards so that we can get people moving again. Hoteliers are tired of having to say to prospective customers, I can't tell you when activities will resume and therefore watch their customers go to other places. And restaurants, <laughs> well, restaurants have been sandbagged so many times by this government, they're on the verge of giving up. Here's, uh, here's Dustin, a young man who has poured his heart and soul into running a Fraser Valley restaurant, who says, don't they understand? I've lost staff, I have to hire, rehire replacements. I have to purchase food and supplies a week at a time and a week in advance. Don't they understand? I can't pivot to open on 24 hours notice. Does the Premier actually understand? And if he does, will he prove it to Dustin and every other business in British Columbia by releasing a restart plan now that they can rely upon and that they can plan around?
Minister of Jobs and Economic Recovery. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. And uh, the, men the member mentioned uh, that uh, business are tired. People are tired. Uh, this pandemic has been hard on everyone. Uh, families with young kids uh, are tired. Uh, they want to get out. The kids want to see other people. Everyone is tired, Honourable Speaker. And that's why the Minister of Health has said so many times in this House for people to please get registered, please get booked, please get vaccinated. Uh, we need to celebrate, as one of my colleagues said, the people that are getting vaccinated. We need to celebrate the people that are actually doing the vaccinating. Uh, the, the member uh, mentions the struggles of, uh, of restaurants. Uh, my family ran a restaurant for over a decade. Uh, I know the challenges. A family-run restaurant where everybody's working at the restaurant. So I know it's hard. Uh, and uh, we've been working closely with uh, the restaurant associations and all the organizations that support them. And again, we will have a plan that opens up, uh, that, that has a restart plan on uh, Tuesday that, that lays out some metrics so that there is some certainty for businesses. And, and, uh, and I appreciate the comments and the intent of the member. And, uh, and that's certainly what we'll try to do on Tuesday. Member for Abbotsford West, supplemental. You know, Mr. Speaker, British Columbians have supported, have genuinely supported public health officials in addressing public health issues. This House has supported public health officials addressing public health issues. But it's the Premier's job and the government's job to plan for the economic restart of this province, and it's about time he and the government started doing their job, Mr. Speaker. You know, you know, the Quebec plan, the Quebec plan sets vaccination targets tied to actual dates, tied to operational decisions about actual activities that people are going to be able to return to. The uh, Saskatchewan plan, I'm glad the Attorney General finds that all funny. He should explain why he's laughing about a, a plan from the province of Quebec. In Saskatchewan, in Saskatchewan, a step-by-step -step reopening roadmap tied to vaccination thresholds and actual dates that allow people to plan, and you know what, actually acts as an incentive for people to get vaccinated. Mr. Speaker, other provinces can do it. Why can't the province of British Columbia do it? Why is the Premier allowing British Columbia to fall further and further behind? Minister of Jobs and Economic Recovery. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. And, and the member says fall further and further behind. I think the member knows that we've been ahead of every other province that he's named. I, I think the member knows that we've had the highest per capita support for people and businesses across the country. And other jurisdictions continue to look to British Columbia for guidance on how to do things, how to keep schools open safely, Honourable Speaker, how to uh, ensure that our seniors are safe, how to ensure that businesses are supported. We're proud of the supports we've put in place. The member should be proud. All of us have been working closely together. And he says that we uh, sometimes, I think he said we sometimes support public health office. Uh, and what they've given us advice on is that we need to get vaccinated. We need to continue to encourage people to follow the rules. And that's what we're encouraging everyone to do today. And there will be a restart plan announced uh, Tuesday. I, I don't know uh, what the issue is. When I've given them the answer, they keep asking the same question over and over again. There will be a restart plan on Tuesday. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, another blow was dealt to this government's attempt to justify their continued inaction on protecting old growth. Three independent scientists did the work, frankly, that the Ministry of Forests should have done a year ago. These scientists mapped out the forests across BC that meet the old growth panel's criteria for immediate logging deferrals. These are the rarest, grandest, highest risk old growth areas in our province. With this blueprint, the NDP government has the information they need to protect these forests. They have the tools that will make this happen. So what's missing? The only thing that's missing, it's become clear over the past year, is the political will to do anything other than to continue to liquidate these forests. My question is to the Minister of Forests. She has the information handed to her. 
She has the tools at her disposal to make the change. Will she live up to the Premier's promise and immediately defer logging in these rare stands of old growth forests? Minister of Forest Lands Natural Resource Operations. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. And we all know that BC's ancient forests are, are part of what makes this province such a great place to live. We are doing the work that needs to be done to protect them. We have started doing that work, protecting hundreds of thousands of hectares. We are continuing to do that work. We are doing the work, and we will continue to do that work. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Sandwich Northern Ireland, supplemental. We're doing the work, we're going to do the work, the work's being done, work, work, work. There's a song about that. <laughs> the fact that that would get a clap is just ridiculous. The answer is brutal, the inaction is brutal, and for the past three years, while we've asked questions about old growth logging, our BC NDP colleagues have stared at the ground, just wishing it would go away. Well, we won't, Mr. Speaker. These ancient forests, our elders, need someone who will stand up for them. Now British Columbians are being arrested because the people who were elected to do so have not. The work has been done by these three scientists who have laid out a step-by-step -step process for the government if they're confused. They couldn't have been more clear. Quote, deferrals are a means to an end, but they are not the end goal. Immediate, appropriate deferrals are critical to create space for conservation, moving rapidly towards identifying adequate forest for protection, recruitment, and long-term resiliency is of utmost urgency." End quote. Mr. Speaker, if you look at the maps that the scientists released yesterday, as I hope the Minister has, you'll be struck by just how little is left. These ancient, majestic forests are vanishingly rare. They look like specks of dust on the map. My question again is to the Minister of Forests. Will she live up to the promise that was made by the Premier and immediately defer logging in these last rare stands of old growth forests? Minister of Forests. Minister of Forests. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And our government has taken action by already protecting hundreds of thousands of hectares of old growth that were pre previously left vulnerable. Uh, we know there's more work to do and we are doing just that. We are engaging with workers, with communities, with uh, companies, with in environmental groups and having those really important government to government discussions with indigenous nations. We are looking at the maps. We are looking at the areas. We are also looking at where the indigenous nations have a right to be consulted, to be to have those discussions with them. And we are undertaking those very, very important discussions. We know that there's more work to do and we are doing that. It might not make the member happy that we aren't doing it on his schedule, but we are doing it on the schedule of the people of the province. We are doing it by ensuring ensuring we are having those very, very important government-to-government -government discussions with Indigenous nations on whose territories he is referring to. We are doing that work, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to do it. Member for Shuswap. Well, thank you, Honourable Speaker. Uh, for more than 120 years, the Interior Provincial Exhibition, the IPE, has been an attraction bringing thousands of people to the communities of Armstrong and Spelmsheen. It honors the region's rural and agricultural experiences, providing a glimpse into the past and showcasing a bright future. But Tuesday, the Premier said that while the PE would be allowed to apply for a grant as a major attraction, it appears that the IPE will not be allowed. The rules say that you have to be operating year round, and specifically states that events uh, like the IPE are not even allowed to apply. And we haven't heard a word from the MLA for Vernon Monashi about helping this very important festival. Can the Premier tell the people of the North Okanagan if the IP can apply or not? Minister of Tourism. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. On Tuesday, the Premier and I announced a significant investment, $50 million, it is a grant, it's not a loan, and it's for anchor attractions. It's for uh, those 
uh, organizations that have large gatherings, which obviously because of the pandemic, we, we can't have right now, uh, turnstile attractions. Uh, there is dedicated funds for the urban sector and the rural and for tour bus operators uh, to facilitate uh, visitors to be going to those anchor attractions. It's a significant investment. I encourage the member to uh, support the organization to apply. Decisions have not been made yet. We've been tr completely transparent about our deadline because we want to get the money out the door as quickly as possible. This was a call to action from the sector about needing relief. And so please encourage uh, your, your organizations to apply and our government will be reviewing them and making decisions and announcement in due course. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Member for West Vancouver, Capilano. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I believe what I just heard the minister say is that events can apply even though on the website it says they are ineligible to apply. So that is, that's good news for us. Um, now very large, or very large attractions like the PNE and the Capilano Suspension Bridge in my riding are in desperate need of help. Instead, the Premier created a two-tiered system that is not based on need and doesn't work for anybody. This is what Nancy Stibbard of the Capilano Suspension Bridge says. And quote, we are grateful, of course, for any help, but for businesses our size, we have had no revenue going on two years, and yet we need to pay fixed expenses of around $1 million a month. The allocation does not seem to make sense, end quote. To the Premier, will he commit today to one program across the province that is needs-based? Minister of Tourism. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. On Tuesday, our government made a significant announcement. $50 million of grants, not loans, to help anchor attractions. I will repeat it, anchor attractions. These are organizations, and I'm not going to name names, but there is a variety of, of uh, different types of attractions that could apply. The member opposite isn't suggesting that the elected minister should be deciding who should get the money. There is a transparent process. There is an invitation for anchor attractions to apply in urban communities and rural, because I, I imagine that the member opposite isn't suggesting that all of the money should go to the urban community, because then we'll be ignoring the rural. We are trying to support the tourism ecosystem across the province. That was a call to action from the sector. We are listening and we're responding with investments to help a sector that we know have been hard hit. And as the Minister for Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation just announced, the restart plan is coming, good news is coming. This is good news, encourage your colleagues to apply. It's a grant, not a loan. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the Minister has been saying since December, good news is coming. What the industry needs is actual tangible action. Groups like the North Thompson Fall Fair in Kamloops and in Barrier are confused about whether or not they can apply for the grant, just like the IPE is confused, and just like, frankly, the PE, although the Minister and the Premier make it sound like they can apply, when you read the criteria, they're actually not eligible. But Playland would be because Playland's an amusement park. So we have a botched program where some attractions have been denied the funding they need based on nothing more than geography. Because other uh, attractions in rural BC need more than a half a million dollars, but they don't get to even apply or ask under this government program because of where their geography is. We have a criteria system that's confusing and says typically operates year round to qualify. Says you can't be a festival or an, or an event, but the minister just said you could be. P&E, like I said, apparently qualifies. Does it or doesn't it? So again, is the Premier making this up as they go along, or do festivals and event qualify or not? For the Minister to say that he would encourage us to work with our constituents to apply for a grant that no one's even sure if they qualify for or not, and neither is the Minister, is a little bit misleading. So does the Minister want them to waste their time applying, or will there be a firm set of criteria put out that is not contradictory? Minister of Tourism. 
Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I know that we can't use props, but I have the description of the qualifications right beside me. The website is online. It's transparent. Um, I, I, I hope that the member opposite isn't suggesting that our government isn't being transparent. We are inviting anchor attractions to apply for a grant, not a loan. We are clearly outlining what the eligibility criteria is. The member opposite just mentioned that people have been denied. How can they be denied? We just opened up the grant on Tuesday. We just denounced $50 million to support the tourism ecosystem. That is good news, member. Encourage people to apply. The application is open for grants, not loans. Decisions haven't been made yet. Please don't make these conclusions and create fear. This was a call to action. It is going to support through targeted funds the tourism sector. But when the member opposite wants to go back to December, December 9th, I received the report from the Tourism Task Force. And shortly thereafter, we announced $100 million in grants, not loans. And to this day, we have over 3,500 tourism operators that received grants, not loans. To me, that is success. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Opposition House Leader Supplemental. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's be clear to the minister, people are being denied the funds they need based on their geography. If they need more than a half a million dollars of support and don't happen to live in the metro area, their attraction is not in the metro area, it's not in the premier's riding, they don't qualify for the help they actually need. That's the point that the minister seems to not understand. And perhaps the minister can dial back her arrogance and confidence from Tuesday and explain to us exactly the position this government is taking in regards to the cruise ship industry. We've just heard earlier that the House of Representatives has now passed the bill. The talk coming out of Washington is they do want to make it permanent. This government still has not taken a firm stand on whether or not they're advocating and actually demanding that the federal government allow technical stops which would not impact public health at all as no one would be leaving the ship as it anchors in Canadian waters on its way to Alaska. Instead, her arrogance is going to cost us the cruise ship industry. When will this government, when will this Premier stand up for the interests of the cruise ship industry in British Columbia and actually demand technical stops happen without undermining any public health measures whatsoever. Minister of Tourism. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I, as Minister for Tourism, Arts, Culture and Sport, it is my job to be an advocate. Clearly, we appreciate and value the tourism, the, the cruise ship industry, and their visits, their intended visits, their purposeful visits, we are a magnet, we are a destination of choice for cruise ships to come from Seattle. But it is on their itinerary, they love coming to Victoria. Members, she That's can't hear you anyway, so member. calm down. <laughs> Minister will continue. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I want to paint the context because we are a destination of choice for cruise ships. Now, with respect to the bill, uh, we are actively advocating with the federal government. They are alive to our concerns about our port and our, our West Coast and our best coast. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, myself, Premier's Office, Intergovernmental Relations, we have all brought to their attention our concerns. It is not off the table for technical stops. We've told them to do whatever it takes to defend our tourism industry, including the cruise ships. We are relentless in our advocacy and we will continue to do the work. But I want to remind for the record member that this is a temporary bill and it does not have a permanent, permanent uh, measure. Uh, it, will be, it will be rescinded as soon as the, the ports and the borders are open. I want to re-emphasize that it's a temporary measure. We're going to call for those technical stops and it will Members, be rescinded let's to the answer, as soon please. as the borders and ports are lifted. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Member for Abbotsford South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Premier is simply out of touch. When we asked him about providing support to the Legion, his answer was baffling. And I quote, 
Protecting those individuals is a very high priority. Making sure they will be sustained throughout and beyond the pandemic is why the e-commerce program was put in place." End quote. The legions don't want a website. They want to be treated fairly and equally and to be able to apply for the same help other liquor and food establishments qualify for. Nothing more, nothing less. These veterans who have served us and continue to serve us deserve respect and they're not feeling it from this government or the Premier. They wrote to the Premier on April 30th. That was 20 days ago. The Premier hasn't listened to them, but he did manage to raise his own budget by four million bucks. My question to the Premier, Will he stop with the posturing and do the right thing and let the legions apply for the funds so that they can survive? Minister of Jobs and Economic Recovery. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. And um, as the Premier highlighted in his remarks, and, uh, and I've made clear that everyone here in this chamber respects our veterans. Everyone respects their contributions to society. Uh, uh, I highlighted that my grandfather uh, was um, a member. Uh, the Premier uh, highlighted that he's been a member since 1979, Honourable Speaker. Uh, so from the beginning of the pandemic, Honourable Speaker, we've been working closely with the federal government on all the supports we put in place from the beginning because it's the right thing to do in a pandemic and it's what the public expects. Uh, I reached out to uh, Veterans Affairs Canada to talk about uh, the, um, the challenges the legions are facing. They notified us that a few months ago that they announced $20 million uh, to go to support the efforts of the legion, $14 million of that to go directly to legions uh, across the country. Uh, in fact, uh, legions in British Columbia have received that support. Uh, but on top of that, uh, we're also looking at other measures to find ways to support them. Staff have reached out uh, to start the conversation about what other measures we can put in place. And we'll continue to work with uh, Veterans Affairs Canada uh, as uh, they have responsibility here as well on what more we can do there. Member for Richmond North Centre. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. 192 families continue to ask questions about the implementation of government policy to delay the declaration of outbreaks in long-term care homes. At Little Mountain Care Home, 41 seniors lost their lives. On November 20th, 2020, the first COVID case was detected. Yet, for days, an outbreak was not declared because of a change in government policy. Bernadette Jung's grandmother died a little mountain, she says, and I quote, people were asking, how did this happen? And then all we got was the reiteration of protocols in place. If families had not talked to the media, this would have been swept under the rug, end quote. My question is to the Premier. Would the Premier tell families why this disastrous policy was implemented at long-term care home? Will the Premier explain what the government knew, when they knew it, and why this government's policy change was kept from the public? Minister of Health. Uh, thank you to the member for her question. Uh, in British Columbia, the, we have made every effort, extraordinary efforts, to protect people in long-term care in a pandemic, both to support their other health needs, which include social needs, but also to keep people protected. And that's happened from the beginning, the single site order that was brought into place. Here in British Columbia, virtually nowhere else in the country has that been done with the effectiveness because we gave it the resources it needed the extraordinary work of the provincial health officer and medical health officers to support people in long-term care. And still, many people have lost their lives in long-term care. 
And we, in every single case, not in some cases, but in every single case, review and work to try and uh, improve the situation in long-term care. And you've seen that reflected in action. The member is asking about the declaration of outbreaks. And she knows that that is statutorily the responsibility of the provincial health officer and medical health officers. And I'm not stepping away from backing them up on that. I support them 100% on these questions, but it's statutorily their authority. And those medical health officers have been with those families and with those residents. People in public health care went into outbreaks to support people because of those efforts. They, in effect, did something that all of us wouldn't want to do, which is move towards the flame and the difficulties. And I think that their efforts and their professional experience and their analysis deserve our respect. It's one thing to say, that we support public health. It's another thing to, to support public health. I do that, recognizing the extraordinary pain that everybody who's lost anyone in this pandemic, but particularly in long-term care feels today. I thank the member for her question, and we're gonna to continue to do everything we can to support our residents in long-term care in the coming months. The bell ends the question period. Members, I have the honor of tabling 2020-2021 Annual Report of the Office of the Merit Commissioner. I have also the honor of tabling a report pursuant to the COVID-19 Relation Measures Act. Madam Clerk. Oh, no, uh, member for Langley East. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I rise in the House today to present a petition related to Order 376 from uh, concerned constituents in my riding. Madam Clerk. Orders of the day. Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Honorable Speaker. In this chamber, I call second reading Bill 9, Finance Statutes Amendment Act. In uh, Section A, the Douglas Fir Room, I call continued uh, estimates debate for the Ministry of Education. And in Section C, uh, the Birch Room, I call continued uh, debates on the, uh, the, the estimates for the Ministry of Energy, Mines, and Low Carbon Innovation. Um, before we start, uh, colleagues, uh, yesterday afternoon there was a uh, division vote called on report out of a committee and you heard uh, uh, my confusion because I had not 
uh, reread this particular member's guide to hybrid sittings five times to know everything in it. Uh, so I did so last night and uh, just want to reiterate that uh, divisions are not permitted on motions that a committee rise and report and also not uh, permitted uh, when the motion is to adjourn. So uh, no divisions on adjournment today, please. Uh, otherwise, I will have to rule it as uh, on division. And the other thing that I noticed in here as I was reading through it is uh, quorum is 10. And uh, I should be uh, not proceeding with the meeting unless we have 10, including the speaker. And so if you have your cameras off, now's a good time to turn them on so we can make sure we have quorum so I can start. And if you're wondering at what point do I ring the bells for lack of quorum, is it will be based on if someone objects to the quorum being gone. So someone rises on a point of order, uh, I will do it at that time. But until that time, I will not uh, mention quorum un uh, unless it's at the beginning. So I see, I see we have quorum and that's great. And the last point I would like to make out is uh, after reading this again, is to uh, be eligible for quorum and for voting, you must have your camera on and be visible in the screen. And I've seen over the last few weeks, a lot of our colleagues uh, having the camera on but facing the ceiling or they being uh, not visible in the shot, but maybe their hair if they do have any, unlike me, um, being visible in the shot, that is, does not qualify. So uh, please, please, please uh, be cognizant of that. Obviously I wasn't. Uh, I thought a few hairs was enough, but uh, uh, that is not the case. So uh, please make sure that if you want to be considered for quorum or voting, that you are in full view in the camera frame. So with that, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right on the line. <laughs> Minister of Finance on Bill 9. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I appreciate uh, that uh, we are all counted and, uh, and, and, and all here, some of us in 3D, some in 2D, um, and it is wonderful to see my colleagues' faces um, on the big screen. Uh, it's particularly delightful to see uh, my critic's face on the screen, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that he's here and that he's well. Um, and with that, I move that Bill 9 be read a second time now. Mr. Speaker, these amendments will give companies, societies, credit unions, and cooperative associations the flexibility to meet virtually, just as we are here today, um, when it is preferred or when it is necessary. As uh, we issued two ministerial orders last year, temporarily removing legislative barriers to meeting electronically, these entities have now become accustomed just as we have here in some ways, to doing business uh, in, a, in a different manner. And what we have learned is that many of these um, uh, companies, societies, credit unions, and cooperative associations are finding that, that uh, having the ability to uh, meet electronically um, is making business uh, more efficient, more flexible, and more widely accessible uh, as well. And I'm happy to say that these amendments will provide electronic meetings as a permanent option. Mr. Speaker, in the last year, businesses and community groups, credit unions, they've all faced new challenges during what has become uh, and what is now known as certainly extraordinary times for everybody. And they've had to find new ways to conduct business, to maintain connections, and to deliver services. Many have capitalized on the technology that allows electronic meetings, and it's only right that we provide them the ability to continue, to continue to make use of this technology going forward, leveraging their new skills um, and their new learnings and their new sayings like, you're on mute, which we've all come accustomed to. These amendments have been drafted in a manner that preserves the right to attend and participate in meetings. An effort has been made to ensure fairness in all meeting attendees. Provisions have been modernized with language that reflects that meetings, may not, uh, that, that, that meetings may not be in person or may not be held at a physical location, and to ensure that instructions for participation or voting may be provided when necessary. For some societies incorporated under the Societies Act, it was preferable during this public health emergency to delay their annual general meetings. A proposed amendment will allow the registrar to extend the legislative deadline to hold annual general meetings in the case of future public health emergencies, for which I hope, Mr. Speaker, we don't have any more. 
Additionally, two housekeeping amendments will solve some minor issues relating to benefit companies. A proposed amendment will clarify that an annual benefit report is required whether there are regulations prescribing the manner of the report or not. Also, member-funded societies will uh, be now able to convert to benefit companies just as they are able to convert to community contribution companies. Enabling corporate entities to meet electronically will improve accessibility to meetings for those with childcare obligations and those with mobility challenges as well. This could very well result in increased diversity on boards of directors of large corporations, as well as improved community engagement in charity and nonprofit work. We have consulted with relevant um, stakeholders, including legal counsel for businesses and societies, cooperative associations, credit unions, and the BC Financial Services Authority and other community groups. Finally, we have been mindful of the requirements of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act as we have developed this legislation. We have done an assessment of this leg legislation as it relates to aligning with the Declaration. And in this case, the proposed amendments do not affect Indigenous peoples in BC in a unique way due to their particular interests, rights, or conditions. We have consulted with Indigenous partners to seek their input and perspectives, including the Métis Nation, the First Nations Summit, and the BC Assembly of First Nations. We have also not notified the Treaty First Nations of the proposed amendments. We will continue to work with Indigenous peoples as we move forward with this initiative to support all of our businesses, community groups, and credit unions in building resilient communities and a strong economy. Mr. Speaker, these amendments will support a strong economic recovery and the provision of community services at a very important time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Recognizing Peace River South. Well, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the Minister as well for uh, the opening remarks here on, on Bill 9. It's uh, Unfortunately, I'm not there in the chamber, but because of technology and what we're really discussing in Bill 9 today, uh, the flexibility, uh, I'm remotely uh, speaking today from my office in Dawson Creek and look forward to being back in uh, Victoria soon and also want to thank the Minister for her, uh, her well wishes. Um, you know, when we look at what's happened and transpired over the last uh, year, 18 months, uh, we've all had to adapt. Uh, as the minister said, some ministerial orders that came forward to allow uh, corporations and some operations to adapt to technology, no different than, than we are uh, today, as I, I highlighted. So uh, it was an important step, I would, uh, I would say, to allow many groups to continue operating. Uh, without uh, those ministerial orders. And I will echo what the minister said. Hopefully, uh, we never find ourselves in a situation like uh, we are in right now where we've had to go to some extreme measures uh, because of COVID-19. But, uh, but I will say that it's brought around opportunity. It's brought around uh, ideas for groups to adapt and look at other ways of operating and doing businesses. And so Bill 9 looks at making some of those ministerial orders, as the minister said, uh, make them more uh, permanent, uh, allowing diversity possibly, allowing people to work from home uh, a little bit more often, uh, allowing groups to operate their business virtually. Uh, it will be uh, a change, I think, uh, in some ways, but one also that many are getting used to over this last year uh, and 18 months. I think the important part is giving the flexibility and the opportunity for these businesses to choose uh, how they want to uh, run some of their meetings, some of their AGMs, and using virtual means to do so. I will say it's a, a fairly straightforward piece of legislation. Uh, it's not one that uh, we obviously will have uh, a lot of probably debate or, or questions on because it does make a lot of sense. Uh, you know, on the surface, the bill seems logical and and barring any surprises, I would say in committee stage is one that we can uh, easily uh, support. However, I will want to highlight for the minister, uh, obviously there always is some limitations when we move to a technological platform, such as uh, what we're doing today, uh, whether it's not just uh, being on mute, uh, but sometimes the opportunities for everybody uh, to participate because of lack of 
uh, connectivity, depending on where they are, whether it's in their home or in their community or some parts of rural British Columbia. I think the big part is the choice for the corporations, banks, um, for the groups to look at virtual means, uh, but also recognizing that we have safeguards in place to make sure it does not restrict or hinder some people uh, from participating because of uh, geography or where they live and connectivity. Uh, we want to make sure everybody is able to exercise their rights to, to, to participate, to attend meetings, uh, whether it's virtual or in person. So again, uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to uh, thank the minister for bringing this forward. I think this again is a, a, logical, a logical step and we'll have a few questions in committee stage. Uh, but appreciate uh, the time on this. And of course, as we work through uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and hopefully, uh, as we've heard today, hopefully we're seeing a, a plan and a stage to move out of the restrictions that we have. Uh, but again, uh, with this Bill 9, it allows flexibility and opportunity going forward, uh, things that we've learned and adapted to over the last 18 months. So with that, Mr. Speaker, I look forward to uh, committee stage and again, thank the minister for bringing this bill forward. Thank you, members. Seeing no further members wishing to participate, I ask the minister to please close debate. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I, I wanna thank uh, the, uh, the member from uh, opposite for uh, his, his comments in, in recognizing that uh, this is a, a really, um, I'm not gonna say easy piece of legislation because I know that staff have worked hard to put this together, but it, it's one that makes sense. It makes sense for British Columbia. Um, and none of us uh, a year, a year and a half ago would have anticipated that we would be doing a bill like this. Uh, but there has been so much change, so much change in the landscape, so much change for all of us in learning the technology um, and the opportunities that come with a crisis because we, we all know that uh, within a crisis, there, there is always opportunity, that there's an opportunity to make um, these meetings uh, for societies and corporations, make them more accessible. And so I'm really proud to, uh, to bring this forward. I'm pleased to hear that uh, members opposite uh, are supporting this. I am looking forward uh, to uh, committee stage. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I move second reading. Thank you, Minister. Uh, members, the question is second reading of Bill 9, Finance Statutes Amendment Act number 2, 2021. Those participating remotely, please prepare your cards. I'd be much more comfortable if we had one more member on the screen. If you're listening and your video's off, could you turn it on for me, please? Thank you so much. Much appreciated. Those in favor indicate aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Motion's carried. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I seek leave to move that not with, notwithstanding Standing Order 81, the bill be committed to a committee of the whole House later today. Members, a request for leave has been made. Those participating remotely should prepare their voting cards. If any member is opposed to the request for leave, please indicate now. Seeing none, leave is granted. Members, the question that Bill 9 be committed to a committee of the whole House later today. Those in favor indicate aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Motion is carried. Are you the government house leader? Yes. Government house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I call Committee of the Whole for Bill 4, Budget Measures Implementation Act. Thank you. We'll uh, give a couple of minutes for change to the committee room.
We will now proceed with uh, Bill 4, Budget Measures Implementation Act 2021, Committee of the Whole on Clause 1. Shall Clause 1 pass? <laughs> Member of Peace River, oh, that's a white card. Okay. <laughs> so, so ordered. Shall Clause 2 pass? Aye. You're putting your hand up. Okay. Go ahead. Peace River South on Clause 2. Yes, thank you, Chair, and, and you know, again, I would have far preferred to have been there doing this in person, so I'll take the Chair's direction on the easiest way uh, to be recognized as we move through this bill. Um, you know, I'll have some multiple questions in different sections, but there's some that I won't have any, so we'll, uh, I think we'll work together uh, to make sure uh, that things work as fluidly as possible. So first of all, thank you uh, to the Minister as we get into Bill 4 and her staff that are uh, virtually just like myself, I assume. Uh, they're uh, helping her out. On This bill covers quite a few different acts and some of the different changes that are, uh, are proposed. Uh, right now we're talking about in this first part here in Section 2 we're around the Assessment Act. And so one of the changes here is around electronic means. Uh, can the Minister, uh, we'll start, explain when we have the addition of electronic, uh, what that means, when it'll be used and how it pertains under the Assessment Act? Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. So um, right now, as it stands, a BC assessment is required to mail assessments uh, to use uh, uh, post or also known as snail mail, uh, and, and that is the requirement. Um, it's not always so snaily. It's actually sometimes very quick. Um, but this, what this change does is it authorizes them to ask if the, if, if the public, if the homeowner would, would, would like to receive by email. So it provides them the ability to ask uh, and so the option is there for the, uh, for the rate payer. So to answer your question, um, members, peace, river, self, any appropriate hand gesture would be fine. Uh, could be live long and prosper. Could just be like this. Whatever works for you will work for us. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Chair. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah, you'll probably only get uh, one typical gesture from me today will be a hand raising, I think, a full hand raising uh, to show my intentions. Um, so to the Minister, then, on that specific uh, answer, is it the intention of the uh, changes uh, from, from assessment authority or for through this act uh, to possibly move completely to uh, electronic means for distribution or is this going to continue to be an option uh, as laid out in the legislation? Minister. Thank you. Um, it, uh, in this legislation, uh, it is just an option. Peace forever, self. Through the discussions, though, does the minister see that uh, we'll be moving to a, a permanent means? Uh, and, and the only reason why I'm flagging that, and I won't, uh, you know, hit this one too hard, but as I mentioned in some of my opening comments, even on Bill Nine, uh, there's, uh, as the minister is well aware, uh, there are parts of the province that do not have the technological means to receive uh, or deliver or correspond in, in electronic ways uh, with any simplicity anyway, uh, because of their geog geographical lo location. So is this something that uh, the minister assumes will be staying uh, as a, an option going forward or is there a chance to make it permanent? Or plans, I guess. Minister of Finance. 
Thank you very much, and, and I appreciate uh, the member, um, you know, the question about, um, you know, access to um, high-speed internet and, and the challenges that come with that. And that's why it is an option, uh, and that's why the intent is uh, to provide it as an option for those British Columbians that uh, that have high-speed internet and uh, have reliable connectivity. Uh, you know, they can receive their uh, their assessment notice electronically. And for those where um, you know they either don't have access to high-speed internet or they still prefer, um, you know, Canada Post and, and paper copies, uh, that, that that's an option for them as well, regardless of where they live in the province. Member. So thank you, Minister. Um, obviously, we've, we've missed this season, so the plan is to, I assume, have the options available for uh, next assessment processes. Uh, what is the... Um, uh, Timeline, I guess, is that is that accurate? It'll be for the next season, and and does the does the minister see possibly any uh, changes around the timing uh, around electronic distribution? Uh, and then maybe what I'll add to that is the minister can also answer at the same time if she chooses is around the application process. Again, if we're timing is for maybe next assessment year, uh, do we see this? Uh, expediting will notices go out sooner or will it be later because electronically and then what's the process for notification for people to apply to receive it electronically Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Um, uh, the, the member asked about uh, timing, and so uh, there is no uh, intent on changing the timing. It will sort of happen the way it has always traditionally happened. Uh, there, uh, there is hope to roll it out for next year, uh, and I'm sure the member can appreciate with the, the volume that, uh, that needs to be done, the volume of work that needs to be done, uh, it, it is possible that it would be the year after, uh, but the intent is certainly to um, get it done sooner than later, uh, and there will be uh, a, a, um, the application process as the, as the, the member uh, detailed around uh, uh, requesting to get uh, your assessment electronically will be built into the website so people could go online uh, and be able to, uh, to ask for that, uh, uh, um, to receive their assessment uh, online instead of through a traditional post. Peace River Self. Yeah, thank you to the minister for that. And it's, um, and I know we're, it's tough on some of these uh, bills because, you know, maybe jumping around from different clauses, but trying to encapsulate it all into the right areas. One of the uh, quest quick questions I guess I have is a lot of organizations, we'll say utility companies, maybe municipalities uh, and others, uh, when they've gone to electronic means of application for uh, receiving, um, in this case, uh, assessment, is there a plan, and I apologize if I did not, if it's in there and I did not see it in the act, but is there a plan then to uh, charge anyone if they continue and choose to receive their assessment notices in paper form? And as I mentioned, a lot of organizations have now started charging, some would say maybe nominal, but you know, a two or three dollar extra charge a month if you do not go. Uh, uh, receiving it electronically. So anyway, is there going to be any kind of financial charge if you continue to receive it uh, on a, in a paper form? Minister. Thank you, thank you very much. And I, I, I do want to reiterate that this is an annual um, 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 uh, um, 
an annual assessment. It's not, not every month, like, like in some of the others, and the, but, and the answer is no. Shall clause two, Pat, no? You, I didn't see your hand. Yep. Yep to which question? <laughs> Did you want to speak? All right, we can, we can move uh, through a few clauses here, Chair. Okay, thank you. Shall clause two pass? Aye. Carried, shall clause three pass? Aye. Carried, shall clause four pass? Aye. Carried, shall clause five pass? Aye. Carried, shall clause six pass? Aye. Carried, shall clause seven pass? On clause seven, Peace River South. Thank you. We'll get the hang of this, uh, Mr. Chair, especially since this is a, even though it's technical in nature, it's a large bill with many, many sections. Uh, so we'll, we'll get a good rhythm going, I am sure, and appreciate your, your patience, everyone. Uh, just quickly on Clause 7, uh, and I thought this might be the appropriate place to ask it, um, but we're talking about sending the assessment notices and everything out through an electronic uh, means for those who apply and appreciate the minister's clarification on the choice uh, for that. Uh, what about for people who choose to dispute or challenge the assessment? Uh, will all of that be able to be done electronically through forms now as well? And I know there are some uh, means in place right now to do some portions of it electronically, uh, but I'm just wanting to clarify, make sure if somebody chooses to go electronic, will they be able to do everything electronically? Minister. Thank you. I'm grateful for the people that are whispering in my ear. It's fabulous. Uh, um, and uh, so I want to take a moment to acknowledge them, and it's, it's great to have them um, just on the other side of my, my earbud. Um, uh, no, we are, we are not changing anything uh, to do with the dispute process. That will remain the same. Shall Clause 7 pass? Aye. Shall Clause 8 pass? Aye. Shall Clause 9 pass? Aye. Shall Clause 10 pass? On Clause 10, Peace River South. You're on mute. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Hopefully I won't make that mistake again. We're getting used to that. Uh, but I know the minister has the voices speaking through her earphones. Um, I don't have earphones in and still have voices in my head. I'm not sure what that means. So we'll hopefully get through this. Um, on Section 10, uh, maybe the minister can just quickly explain the reasoning for this addition. Uh, you know, we're going to go through this act, and there's quite a few places where uh, the minister has highlighted um, additional information and in different acts that the government is requesting or availability to access. Uh, so I'll probably ask a similar question uh, a few times throughout the course of today as we go through this Act, but specifically under Section 10, we are now talking about uh, the Carbon Tax Act. And in this section, the minister is uh, quickly are, are talking about how Section 10 adds authority for the disclosure of certain information for fiscal policy formulation and evaluation. What information does the minister see that the ministry and her staff would want to gather through the Carbon Tax Act uh, to be able to use for other uh, taxation plans that the government would be looking at doing? What information are we looking for? Just for clarity for Hansard, clauses seven through nine were carried. Thank you.
Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, so on Clause 10, um, you know what it does, it will allow uh, an official or employee of the Ministry of Finance to use taxpayer information that is already collected, so it's already collected, um, under the Carbon Tax Act. Um, to, um, to develop and evaluate fiscal policy. So I can give the member an example, because uh, that's, that's what he's asked for. So for COVID-19, uh, we've been developing uh, numerous uh, recovery plans to help businesses um, get through and understanding and targeting uh, resources uh, to help uh, certain you know, kinds of businesses, recognizing that not all businesses were equally impacted uh, in the same way. Um, and so in, 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 in trying to make a determination on how to best support businesses, uh, we're currently not able to actually see uh, the carbon tax return uh, because of uh, we, we don't have that flexibility, and which is another, which is an indicator that would help us understand um, how well or how poorly uh, a business is doing. And so we don't have access to that information, and, and this amendment would, uh, would allow us to, to take a look at information that is already collected uh, and be able to help guide uh, decisions uh, on how to best support businesses and, and industries. So Clause 10 pass. Oh, on Clause 10. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, just so to the minister, just trying to wrap my head around this of why the change. So the minister just highlighted that this is information that the government is already collecting. Um, so I'm, it just, of course, just raises some questions then if, if the government's already collecting it, but the wording uh, an addition here that the uh, minister has added uh, through this clause and in other parts of this specific uh, bill there's other acts that have similar uh, wording changes and so i'm just curious if the minister can explain then you know they're already the government's already has a lot of this information but now they're putting in specific wording saying that they want to access that information to formulate use that word i know it says formulate and evaluate evaluate i can understand you want to look at the process for a specific tax policy uh an initiative to see you know it's going to be evaluated against the the revenues or the costs based on uh the policy that's in place is it working is it not working but when you use the word formulate i'm just curious if the minister can just elaborate a little bit further on on that because to me formulation of fiscal policy would mean gathering that information and possibly information as the minister, as we'll talk about later on, the minister is accessing or wanting to through other acts as well. Of course, the cynic would say, okay, well, government is trying to look at getting this more information to create further taxes or tax policy. And so can the minister just explain when you use the word formulation, uh, what's the intention there? If you already have access, why do we need this wording and change in the bills? Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So currently there's three tax related statutes, the Employer Health Act, the, the Employer Health Tax Act, the Income Tax Act, and the Speculation and Vacancy Tax Act that explicit, explicitly permit Ministry of Finance to use taxpayer information to develop and evaluate fiscal policy. Um, and, uh, and, and this amend, this amendment aligns the Carbon Tax Act with these three statutes with respect to using taxpayer information for fiscal policy purposes. And that uh, can also mean developing programs developing uh, relief programs, like I just outlined, uh, which uh, I think uh, uh, you know, businesses have been asking for. Um, and so understanding the lay of the land, uh, seeing how it all fits together, um, is, is really uh, in, important. So it's also about f you know, um, formulating programs and program development, uh, and, uh, and certainly, um, certainly under COVID-19 framework, it's been um, absolutely critical to have as much information available uh, to us so that we could be as responsive a government as possible. Shall Clause 10 pass? Aye. So ordered. Shall Clause 11, on Clause 11, Peace River South? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, still talking about, obviously, under the Carbon Tax Act. Um, maybe the Minister can explain a little bit around, I guess, on Section 11 here, and it's kind of trying to encompass a couple of sections possibly together here in some ways under the Carbon Tax Act uh, through my questions. Uh, but we're looking at extending the application now for the tax rates for fuels combustibles to 2022. Um, maybe the minister can explain the rationale through some of the changes, because as we know, as of, I believe, April 1st, 
Uh, the carbon tax has gone up again in British Columbia. So given the pandemic is still going on, the idea was freezing the carbon tax that this government chose to raise, but they chose to also freeze the carbon tax uh, increase, citing it was uh, because we were in a pandemic. Uh, why did the minister, why is the minister not continuing on with that freeze um, uh, going forward until we know whether we're out on the other side? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, you know, uh, to, to the member's question, um, in March 2020, um, our world uh, turned upside down and we really didn't understand how we were going to um, respond to the health crisis. Um, and, uh, the, you know, we knew that we needed to uh, slow everything down, slow our lives down, slow the economy down in a very significant way. Um, and we didn't know how long it was going to last. Um, and so it's based on that that um, government decided to delay this increase. Uh, but we have learned lots. We have learned lots over this last year. Uh, we've learned how to use technology in ways we haven't uh, ever done before. We've learned how to mute and unmute ourselves. Um, we've learned how to turn our cameras off and on um, and off again sometimes, Mr. Speaker. And we have learned uh, that uh, with vaccination, uh, we are, um, 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 you know, operating um, on, a, on a frame now and in anticipation, certainly with a Tuesday in a, in a few more days, hearing about, you know, what opening looks like. And, and I, again, I want to remind everyone in this house that we never really closed down. We're very fortunate here in British Columbia, some of it due to timing, a lot of it due to great leadership at public health, that we've been able to essentially keep things going, albeit um, in, at a slowed pace, but um, there's certainly, um, you know, um, activity happening. Um, and so it's with that in mind that we recognize that things are picking up. They're picking up speed, and I look forward to um, when we can all be in this chamber all together, um, all 87 of us. I, I think there's lots of uh, appetite uh, around, around um, the province for my colleagues who are coming to us through the, um, the internet, that um, having everyone here will certainly um, remind us what we've all come through and, and you know, where we're all going, and I, and, 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 and I know it's hopeful. We heard today in question period about reopening plans in other jurisdictions. We're going to hear more about ours on Tuesday. Uh, and so it's with that in mind, uh, recognition that in many ways uh, we are uh, coming out of this crisis. Um, there's still some, certainly some, some pieces to address, and there's some hard work and heavy lifting for all of us to be doing together. Uh, but uh, with, it's with that in mind that we recognize that we are on the tail end of this, um, and uh, we're uh, going to be proceeding forward uh, with, uh, with those, these increases, as originally planned. Peace River South. Oh, thank you, Chair. You know, I appreciate the, the optimism, I guess, from the the minister that we are on the uh, homeward stretch we can see the ribbon ribbon at the finishing line as more and more people get vaccinated uh, i do want to just highlight though that the changes that the minister uh, has talked about and the changes that were made in march were before that optimism was thought of before this government was speaking in any way of any uh, forward-looking plan or optimism around uh, how this was going to affect uh, our economy, how how changes have effect. I am a little, uh, I, I, well, I will respectfully say to the minister, um, when she said our, how lucky our province was that it didn't close, uh, I think she would agree and acknowledge, though, that uh, it, it's not that simple, that there are many people that were affected. There's many businesses uh, that were forced to close. Uh, many businesses that are still battling whether they will be able to afford to stay open or not. And so I do find it interesting that the uh, the freeze on the carbon tax uh, was lifted before that optimism was spoken of uh, by this government. So I'm just curious then, what happens then for a lot of these companies that don't have that optimism, that don't have uh, the means uh, and who are struggling already. They're going to be forced now possibly into a situation where uh, things have not 
brightened for them. The light is not at the end of the tunnel for these uh, organizations or individuals for that matter, uh, but the carbon tax freeze has been lifted and so extra costs are incurred by those groups that are already uh, struggling. So why did the minister uh, not consider putting that off a little longer? Um, or uh, I would argue, why did the minister not back in February or March uh, be a little bit more optimistic with a plan saying, don't worry, uh, we are actually going to be opening up the province here right away. So you'll be able to get back to normal, uh, get your revenue generated and people back to work and opportunity to pay your bills. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, well, you know, the member just talked about why didn't we do this in February or March? Um, you know, back in February, we weren't uh, sure about what the supply of vaccine was going to be like. Uh, and there were certainly lots of angst around that. And uh, we, uh, so there were certainly, um, you know, uncertainties. But I also want to point out that, you know, as a government, we've, con we've we started out uh, back last fall uh, delivering on a stronger BC plan, making sure that there was opportunities for businesses, supporting them, helping them through working together with the federal government, layering in our programs on top of the federal program so that it would be as robust as possible. Uh, we certainly continue to um, deliver uh, supports for businesses and for individuals. Uh, we're uh, continually engaged with, with them to determine how to best support them through these next number of months, we'll, which will continue to be hard for some, for some businesses. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, and so it's through that engagement that we are targeting our supports and making sure that there's opportunities. Uh, so, um, you know, that is, uh, has been our, um, uh, our, our, the way that we have been operating as a government is to engage with the sectors, understand what their particular challenges are, work together with our federal partners, uh, and to deliver support so that people can make it through the other side. And for some, it will take some time. There's absolutely no doubt about that. No one is disputing that. Um, and for others, um, you know, things you know can and will pick up. And yet, there are other industries where there has been, you know, almost little impact, or or there has been significant growth and opportunity um, for them um, through the pandemic. So, you know, we are recognizing that different sectors are impacted in different ways. We're continuing to engage with them. But we also recognize that we have a climate crisis, that that's, this isn't the only crisis that we're dealing with. Uh, and we know that we need to uh, address um, um, uh, GHG reductions. And we also know that a carbon tax is, is you know, a significant tool in helping us to do that. So uh, taking all these things into consideration, uh, this is why we delayed the increase last year uh, and recognizing that we are uh, you know, right at the, the cusp, the ribbon cutting, as the, the member said, and I, uh, I look forward to celebrating with all of my colleagues here in the House when we can all be together and, and cut ribbons, I hope, uh, that we've, we've, we've come through. Uh, um, and we recognize that uh, um, it is important to um, also do the work of the other uh, crisis that we're dealing with, which is the climate crisis. On Clause 11, Peace River South. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, you know, don't want, I guess want to use the analogy too much on the finish line because I don't want to make it look like we're a race to that finish line. We still have to uh, do a lot of work. Uh, and, you know, the Minister of Health and has done an extraordinary job, I would say, too, with uh, a, lot of, a lot of this, de dealing with this for the last 18 months. So commend him and the government for dealing with this crisis as best as possible, although we do criticize some of the changes. Uh, that should be taking place. I think we're all in this collectively of trying to make sure that our communities, our society, and the people uh, get through this as soon as possible and we get our economy rolling. But back to the point at hand, uh, the minister just said that back in February, she didn't know. But yet back in February, uh, the minister made the changes to increase the carbon tax. Uh, in the midst of also saying she didn't know what the future would hold. I understand, and I, I, this probably isn't the right place or forum at this time to debate uh, the carbon tax, because the minister says that that's also a, uh, a crisis, um, but yet increasing the carbon tax, uh, and yet while at the same time we see carbon emissions going up. So it'll be interesting to see that analysis uh, as 
the minister is saying that this will curb behavior, I guess. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that changes. But I guess the main point or question uh, that I'll, I'll flag at this time is if the minister didn't know back in February what the future would hold, but chose to take the freeze off the carbon tax anyway, uh, does she feel confident then that this is not going to negatively affect our economy in any way with the increase of the carbon tax? Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So the member, uh, you know, I think knows full well, full well that, um, you know, we meet with the Economic Forecast Council who, um, you know, about a dozen uh, economists that take a look at opportunities that, that lay ahead for British Columbia and what the opportunities are. And, and they're, um, they're very confident about uh, growth for our economy in the coming year. Uh, and it's their good counsel and their expertise that uh, that we we rely on uh, to help us make uh, these fiscal these fiscal choices. Uh, and so it's uh, and I know that the member is well aware that the member was was at that meeting, uh, and uh, we have uh, as a government uh, been prudent in 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 our budgeting around you know how fast or how strong the economy will come back. Um, but it uh, there all signs point to a to a strong recovery. Uh, in fact. Uh, suggesting that our recovery will be the strongest in the nation. Um, we're, we're being cautiously optimistic, of course, because I think that's the wise thing to do. Uh, so I don't believe that this will have uh, a significant uh, drag on the economy, as the member uh, has suggested. Peace River South on Clause 11. Thank you, Chair. And, and I do appreciate that the minister included me in uh, the briefings and the information around the Economic Forecast Council. Uh, there were some flags that were raised, but definitely some opportunities for British Columbia as well. What about the CFIB though? I look at an organization like that that represents so many of our small business. They've been very vocal uh, to this government and to this minister that the carbon tax in general, but definitely any increase in the carbon tax will be uh, a negative impact for our small businesses, not only just for through a recovery program as we try to get our, our economy back to uh, a thriving area for across the province, uh, but, but in the short term, uh, every little nail in the coffin uh, is and can be detrimental to some of our, especially small business, our mom and pop operations, um, you know, large businesses as the Minister, and I know the Minister of Energy and Mines has alluded to, you know, have an opportunity to uh, absorb increases and have can be a little bit more flexible on their opportunity for reducing carbon emissions to offset the increase. Uh, a little mom and pop shop can't. In the agricultural industry, there's not a lot of changes that they can necessarily make. So I'm just kind of curious uh, from a CFIB's perspective, who's very vocal on this, does the minister listen to their concerns as well? Because they were very vocal that this could be a negative impact for small business, especially in a time when we're still going through the COVID crisis where revenues are way down for a lot of the people in the uh, private sector. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, well, I, as I said earlier, um, um, when we delayed the, tar the carbon tax increase, it was a, a very broad, um, a broad uh, sweeping um, um, program. 
call it, um, because we weren't sure how things were going to play out. And we've certainly learned a lot, as I'd mentioned earlier, through the, through the pandemic, uh, that we are better off to uh, deliver targeted supports for those businesses that are hardest hit. Uh, and that's what we have been doing, and being um, much more precise and much more uh, specific and focused on our relief programs, as was recommended by the Economic Forecast Council. It was there. It was also their advice that that was that the time now in the, in 2021 that uh, certainly when we met with them, I think it was back in March. I'm sort of it's all sort of a time before, but it was I think it was back in March when we met with them. Um, or maybe it was February, um, where they, they were really clear that it, now it's time for targeted support. And so we, we have taken their advice um, and, and have done that. The other thing that's really important um, is that Canada, the uh, nationally, uh, the, the federal government, has a backstop of $50, $50 that is um, coming in, in, in uh, by 2022. And we have heard from businesses that it's much easier to have a, a slow ramp up uh, it, it's easier for them to absorb rather than uh, a hard uh, deadline, which is coming up uh, for a $50 um, uh, per ton uh, cost that is going to be imposed um, federally. So it is for, the, for this reason that it's important to get, to get back on track and to move this along because um, businesses have told us that that's much easier for them. Peace River South on Clause 11. Can the minister then just explain then, obviously she highlighted and mentioned the federal government's uh, initiatives that they're planning around the carbon tax. Uh, what's the future carbon tax increase going to look like for British Columbia then? How does she, the minister see that rolling out um, given the new federal pricing plans? Uh, that'll be the question, but I just want to obviously just highlight for the minister, though, I'll, once we get to estimates on uh, Ministry of Finance, I can have some more detailed, uh, more accurate, uh, pointed questions around the carbon tax and the, lot, the fact that it's no longer revenue neutral, uh, et cetera. Uh, but more curious on what the minister's thoughts or plans are with the federal government's initiatives then for the increases in British Columbia, how that's going to look. Minister of Finance. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, I appreciate the, the members the members question and uh, certainly heard uh, along with us. I believe it was April nineteenth that the federal government talked about this, and so uh, this is work that is uh, that is being undertaken. And I, I can't speak to what we may do at some point in the future, but we're certainly going to be working uh, diligently to address how to best proceed with the carbon tax. Peace River South. So it's, it is interesting that the minister says she doesn't, they don't have the plans for the future. Maybe she has plans they're not willing to say uh, because it's still being formulated and I understand that and how the process uh, works. But certainty obviously is important. So we'll be at $50 next year. Is that obviously the federal government is pushing that in for next year. I assume that's what British Columbia is going to uh, do their part to adhere to that. Can the minister foreshadow or let us know then if the government of British Columbia has any plans to go further than what the federal initiatives are, or is that another wait and see uh, from this government? Minister of Finance. There, there'll be more to be sit, to, to be to say about that um, at another time. Shall clause eleven pass? Aye. So ordered. Shall clause twelve pass? Aye. So ordered. Shall clause thirteen pass? Peace River South on thirteen. Uh, thank you, Chair. When we get into Clause 13, and uh, I recognize the time, so I don't know if I'll get a chance to get through uh, this entire clause uh, before lunch, but we're now dealing with the employer's uh, health tax portion of, under that Act and some of the changes uh, again. So maybe we can uh, start. How many, Under the employer's health tax, um, you know, this in Clause 13 enacts a provision, I guess, providing 15% credit on increases in payroll between October 1, December 31st. I'm reading through the explanatory notes there. Um, this is the first uh, applied to the EHT payments, but is refundable. Can the minister maybe just walk me through that a little bit in these changes in this section and what the purposes are and how that's going to help business?
Minister and noting the hour. Th thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I believe uh, the member was re is referring to the increased employment incentive uh, uh, um, that, uh, that we brought in. And this just gives uh, businesses a 15% credit if they increase their payroll. Uh, and it's intended to boost the, econ uh, the economy and employment um, as, as uh, we've been recovering and, and it's had some uh, really good, uh, good results. Um, and I, noting the hour, I, I, uh, the, I move that the committee rise, report progress, and ask leave to sit again. Members, you have heard the question. Those participating remotely, please prepare your voting cards. Those in favor, indicate aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Motion carried. Committee Chair. Mr. Speaker, the Committee on Bill 4 rises, reports progress, and asks leave to sit again. When shall the committee sit again, Minister? The next sitting. So ordered. Committee Chair. Mr. Speaker, the Committee of Supply, Section A, reports progress on the estimates of the Ministry of Education and seeks leave to sit again. When shall the committee sit again, Minister? The next sitting. So ordered. Committee Chair. Mr. Speaker, Committee of Supply, Section C, reports progress on the Ministry of Energy, Mines and Low Carbon Innovation and asks leave to sit again. When shall the committee sit again, Minister? At the next sitting. So ordered. Government House Leader. I move that the House do now adjourn. Members, you heard the motion. All those in favor indicate aye. aye. Those who oppose indicate nay. Motion carried. This House stands adjourned until 1 p.m. this afternoon.